hacking, driverless cars, crazy fast 5G service is coming, and Apple News. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 419 for Tuesday, September 8th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by the new Epson Workforce printers powered by Precision Core. Workforce is an award-winning line of all-in-one printers for your home office, small to large business, or corporate work groups. Visit epson.com to find out more. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney. Welcome back to the show. Thanks to Padre and Mike for filling in for me while I was gone on a fifth grade field trip. And I hope those of you in the U.S. had a nice Labor Day. Tomorrow is Apple's big event in San Francisco. We'll have full coverage of the keynote at 10 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. And after the break, Jason Aberziz and I will discuss one possible game changer that will be announced at the event tomorrow. I will give you a hint. I do not think that it's my Apple car. Now let's get to today's big tech news. Have you heard about the Raspberry Pi? It's a $60 maker kit. Helps you teach kids about coding and computers. And you know what else you can do with it? You can hack a self-driving car. A principal scientist at Security Innovation says he can trick an autonomous vehicle into stopping, swerving, or avoiding non-existent objects. All he needed was a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino and a simple laser pointer. The security researcher claims that the attack can be carried out from behind, in front, or from the side of the car without alerting the car's passengers. Any self-driving cars that use LiDAR, that's a laser-based radar, are vulnerable to the hack. Right now, Google, Lexus, Mercedes, and Audi all use LiDAR in their autonomous vehicle prototypes. Today, Verizon announced that they will begin field testing a ludicrously speedy 5G network at some point next year, although it won't be up and running until 2017 and then only on an enterprise level at first. 5G could theoretically give you 50 times the speed you get on 4G and will be designed to support the Internet of Everything world of endless devices. GeekWire reports that Amazon has officially stopped selling the Fire Phone. The page for the Amazon-branded phone still appears on Amazon's site, but it is now marked as currently unavailable. The Fire Phone was, by all accounts, a complete and utter failure. Sources say that since the phone flopped, Amazon has reorganized its secret hardware lab and fired at least a dozen engineers. According to the Wall Street Journal, Amazon's next foray into hardware will be a tablet with a six-inch screen set to come out in time for the holidays and selling for the ridiculously low price of $50. So what happens when you introduce a Google Watch to a country where Google services are largely unavailable? Well, we are about to find out. Today, The Verge says that Lenovo, Motorola, and Google are bringing the Moto 360 Android Wear smartwatch to China. You'll be able to use the watch with any Android device, but instead of using Google Now and Google Play, the Moto 360 in China will use a Chinese company called Mobvoi to provide search and voice recognition. This news follows the story that broke late last week that Google is planning to re-enter mainland China. And just before the show, news broke that antivirus pioneer, pioneer John McAfee has officially filed the paperwork to enter the United States presidential campaign. McAfee calls himself an eccentric and has been described by others as increasingly erratic. There are some questions about his citizenship, although he appears to have been born on a U.S. Army base in Great Britain. He's had his share of controversy, especially in recent years. So welcome, John. You are going to fit right in in this race. Coming up, will Apple's new news app change the way we consume news? And please do not kick our robot overlords. But first, this episode is brought to you by the new Epson Workforce Printers powered by Precision Core. Now you can do business better and leave laser printing in the dark. The new Epson Workforce Printers use ink, not laser toner. They're more efficient and the cost per page is up to half of a color laser printer. Unlike laser printers, there's no warm up time. You can print on a wide range of media and you get print shop quality with vibrant colors and clear, crisp text. The high resolution Epson print chips are one of the fastest inkjet printing technologies in the world. Go to epson.com today, find out what the new workforce printers can do for you and for your business. That's E-P-S-O-N.com, Epson built to perform. Tomorrow is Apple's big event in San Francisco. We'll probably see at least three new product line updates, including new iPhones, possibly new iPads, and a new Apple TV. And we will likely get a final release date for Apple's newest operating system, iOS 9. And one of the many anticipated features of iOS 9 is a revamped 
app for news. The previous app, Newsstand, was clunky and outdated. It hid your subscriptions. It didn't update as regularly as we require in our crazy 24-hour Twitter-inspired desire for instant news as it happens. Joining us to talk about the new iOS news feature is Mashable reporter Jason Abruziz. Welcome, Jason. Thanks a lot. Good to be here. So what do you know about the new app? Uh, you know, we know a little bit so far. I think one of the most interesting things we know is that publishers are very encouraged by the deal that Apple's offering them. Uh, you know, when uh, a publication is on there, they can run their own ads. And uh, if they're running their own ads, they get to keep all the revenue. So, uh, you know, Apple News starts off, at least for now, as a way to, you know, hopefully get onto the home screens of, of millions of people on Apple products around the world, you know, without giving up any revenue. That's That's a big value proposition. Right, so Mashable will be one of the content providers, the New York Times, BuzzFeed, Quartz, ESPN, Wired, a lot more. Um, how much can you tell us about the deals these publications have made with Apple? Sure, so I think it depends on the publication. Um, you know, some of the bigger publications like the New York Times and things like that, we know have been working with them very closely. Their look might be a little more specialized and, and, and closer to, you know, how the New York Times looks online or even in, in real life. Uh, but uh, Apple's made this program pretty widely available to even, you know, smaller, you know, online blogs and things like that. They might not get as much specialization or as much attention um, since the, uh, the t it's, it's just a template. And so you just talked about uh, Newsstand, which was kind of the polar opposite. Newsstand was basically just a place to place your, your own app, but you still had to make the app. It was very difficult on publishers. They had to spend a lot of money. This is just, you know, you know, it's as easy as plugging in an RSS feed if you want to go to the, the bare basics. So, you know, we can see, you know, a wide difference in, in what publishers look like, but it's all going to be relatively uniform within that template. So Newsstand was kind of designed, uh, like I said before, when we didn't want these constant updates, but also when uh, sources thought they could really um, use paywalls that a lot of people, especially the New York Times, experimented with all kinds of things. But there was a time where you really, uh, I think publishers really thought that they were going to have everybody paying for content on the Internet. And so that was that kind of why Newsstand was designed the way it was? That's a big reason. So, I mean, you look at Newsstand, it's a great uh, representation of something that kind of had one foot in the future, one foot back in the past. The foot in the future was like, we need to put the media online. We need to put it on people's home screens. What if we put it all in one place and made it easy to organize? I mean, it sounds good in theory. And, and really back then it did make sense. But particularly in the last few years, we've seen news evolve to become something that, as you kind of pointed out earlier, 24 hours a day, you know, reaction time that's, you know, minutes upon seconds. And, uh, you know, is need to be constantly updating. That's just not what the newsstand was built for. It was built for this kind of older, let's make subscriptions. Let's update monthly or weekly or biweekly or whatever our subscription schedule is. And as you said, let's, you know, just make a way so that, you know, we can keep the subscription model going. Now we're kind of seeing that, you know, maybe subscriptions are going to work online for a few publications, but it's just not going to be a widely accepted way to, to do business. And so how will the new news app compete with something like Facebook instant articles that we've heard a lot about? We haven't really seen it fully roll out. Uh, explain a little bit about what Facebook, Facebook instant articles is. Yeah, I mean, it is really an interesting time because we're starting to see this arms race evolve. Like Apple's doing Apple News and Facebook has instant articles. It's the same idea is that they want to work with publishers, put media directly onto you know, their, their platforms, and then you know, either host ads or sell ads against it. Apple's not taking a cut, but Facebook is. Facebook Instant Article is probably going to be pretty similar. It's supposed to live within Facebook, whereas Apple News kind of obviously lives within the Apple News app. Uh, on Facebook Instant Articles, you know, we've seen only a few come out, but we know, we've, you know, we've heard, we know that more are on the way. Um, it's just going to be an interesting, an interesting time to see, you know, which one comes out on top. Facebook obviously has some, some big advantages in, in its traffic flow and overall audience, but Apple also does have the home screens of, of you know, millions of users. So is it, uh, is it also meant to solve the speed problem? I mean, my problem with Facebook is... I'll see an article, I want to read it, I'll click it on my phone, and then I get bored waiting and I move on before it actually, I see the article. Is it supposed to solve that problem too? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big ones that everybody's trying to solve. Uh, Facebook has said from the start that Instant Articles is, is meant to, you know, make a more streamlined experience. They, they see that, you know, depending on what website you're going to, if you pull it up or you get linked to it from Facebook, it can take, you know, four or five seconds. Obviously, that kind of sounds ridiculous to say that that doesn't seem like a long time. But the matter, the, the fact of the matter is that it is. So Facebook and Apple want to keep people on their platforms. And one of the ways they're doing that is, yeah, trying to make these apps very fast, very streamlined, very easy to use, you know, very on demand so that, you know, when you open it up, you know, you're just, you're just kind of very happy with the experience.
I mean, you said that Apple will have the advantage of being um, having people's home screens, but I think Facebook already has that. I mean, you you know, Facebook is on most people's mobile devices, uh, and then you're there for another reason besides news. I mean, do you think that Facebook will already have the advantage that Apple's kind of coming too late because I'm I'm already at Facebook. There's so many other things. There's messaging there, uh, so I'm expect you know it's likely that I will also want to stay there for my news. Without a doubt, I mean, if you if you call this a race, Facebook has a very very big head start. Um, Apple, you know, like I said, you know, it's it's nice to be on everybody's home screen, but so was newsstand back in the day, and nobody was using that thing. So just being on the home screen is not good enough. If Apple can make a good product that people enjoy using and want to come back to, I think it's going to be a success. But yeah, they've got a long ways to go to catch up to Facebook, which you know what had a billion day, uh, uh, users in one day recently. I mean, people are just on Facebook constantly. It makes it a natural extension to just get into media. And what about Twitter? I mean, I don't know a lot of people in my daily life. My people in my daily life use Facebook, not Twitter. So Twitter is where I get most of the news. It's where I spend a lot of my work day. Where do they fall in for the average person in terms of how people get their news? So Twitter's working on that. I mean, Twitter is kind of the best place for breaking news right now. That's really what that platform has has done better than anybody else. Uh, you know, whether that was their their own fault or just by you know kind of what it became. It's tough to say, but they are trying to make it easier for the average person, for the lay person, maybe even for non-logged in users to come to Twitter and have a good news experience. We got teased with uh, Project, Project Lightning, which we haven't heard too much about, but we're starting to get an idea of what that's going to look like. It's going to be a lot more curation by Twitter. It's going to be, again, a lot more visual like all these, all these other places. The media is going to live you know, primarily on this, you know, this platform. So if you go to Twitter, it's not just going to be a list of you know, people tweeting and links and links and links. It's going to be a curated uh, news experience where Twitter is using algorithms and people to kind of surface the best stuff and, and organize it in a way that provides something of a narrative. And they're all, you know, it'll be event-based also. That's what I understand from Project Lightning. You know, when, if there's some kind of, a, you know, a big event, then it'll be, everyone will be tweeting about that and you'll be easily be able to find that, I guess. Oh, without it, I think events is the best use case. But even, even things, even things like, you know, just regular news stories, like we just saw that the, uh, I think the CEO of United stepped down. Uh, I think that they could put together a perfectly fine, you know, collection of tweets and articles and, and visuals from that. But it will certainly be interesting to see if it could even evolve into a long-form storytelling tool if you can compile a lot of things over time. Uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of you know, interesting angles to it, but it also does not have the advantage that Facebook has in the audience, doesn't have the advantage of being on home screens everywhere automatically like Apple does. And where does Snapchat fit in in terms of news? Who gets their Snapchat's, news from Snapchat? Sure. I mean, Snapchat's pretty exciting because like, they're kind of – you're kind of an also ram, but you can't call them that because they have so many users. But people, you know, don't I think value trying to get news to younger people uh, as much as they should. And and Snapchat is where where younger users are on their smartphones. We've seen the data, we've seen the numbers. It's incredible. Um, Mashable is actually fortunate enough to join uh, Discover recently, and uh, we got a peek at the numbers, and and they're, and they're really impressive. They're they're it's pretty awesome. How many people are on it? How many people are going through the whole thing? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think it kind of exists apart from. From the Twitter, Facebook, and and um, and uh, Apple News, because it is a, also kind of a closed environment. You know, you can't just uh, sign up. You have to kind of work with Snapchat. You have to develop, uh, you know, your content to look good on there, to load quickly, things like that. So I think that it's it's a very interesting. It's very young. Uh, we're all kind of like really fascinated to watch like how it grows and and if young people, you know, keep using it. It is fascinating. I mean, you also, if you're a young Snapchat user, you also have to convince your parents to let you use it because it has a horrible reputation for the place where just kids sext each other, which is not true. So, uh, yeah, that's one leap you have to get over or else maybe your parents aren't paying attention. So you don't have to. You could just it, use it to get well, your news without asking. It, and maybe that's a reason Snapchat wants news to get on there. So, you know, obviously, you know, they can monetize against news. It's the kind of content that ads are being sold against and they get a cut of that. So certainly a way for them to bring in money. It's also a way for them to get a little more legitimate and try to start kicking a little bit of that, you know, older um, uh, reputation that it, that it gained. Right. So now iOS 9 also includes ad blocking software for the first time uh you know it's been a bit controversial uh they're promising they're promising that the publishers in the news app will be able to make money from that part of the news app so presumably the ad blocking software is only for for the mobile for the the mobile browser not for apps they're they're still going to allow ads inside the apps correct that's how, that's what we understand right now and certainly there are not going to be any ads being blocked within apple news which again kind of gives publishers an extra little incentive to move in that direction 
Um, but yeah, ad blocking is going to be a really fascinating thing to watch here because really never before will it be easier for people to kind of get ad blockers and use them, you know, on their phone. Uh, I've used ad blockers before, but really only on desktop. And, it, you know, it was a slightly clunky thing. You know, it's usually extensions or something. You had to know what you were looking for. You had to be able to set them up. But with Apple now, it seems like they're not necessarily encouraging them. They're not doing a lot to, to, to dissuade anybody from doing it. So if it becomes as easy as just downloading an app and firing it up and then you have an ad blocker, you know, we can see uh, we can see some fallout from that. We can see it definitely having an impact on some uh, on some media companies. Yeah, I mean, they're just making it a little more legitimate. I used to always feel like, oh, I'm doing something wrong if I'm using an <laughs> yeah. ad blocker. Especially you are doing something wrong if you're using a touch. <laughs> well, I mean, if you work in a business supported by ads, then yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is, yeah, that, that it's, whole It's the old great for consumers, but bad for, for the company story. But that just means, you know, companies like Mashable, all of the media companies out there have to figure it out, have to, you know, see what they're going to do next. Uh, this is something that Jonah Peretti at BuzzFeed has preached for a long time. You know, BuzzFeed doesn't sell any display ads. They go all native. Uh, I would guess that native is not being blocked by ad blockers. We'll see what happens with that. It'll be interesting to watch. But, you know, there are other ways than display ads, and we may just be getting pushed there even quicker. So as long as we're talking about news and Apple rumors, now we're pretty sure that the new Apple TV box will give us access to an Apple TV app store. We'll hear about that tomorrow. Today, TechCrunch says that the live streaming app Periscope, which is owned by Twitter, is developing an app for the Apple TV. Uh, how do you think this might be a game changer for live streaming? It's interesting because I, I personally have not felt that live streaming has really found that that you know you know killer combination of platform and use case. Um, you know we've seen Facebook kind of start experimenting with live streaming recently, and that's gone pretty well. Um, you know obviously Periscope was a big one. Meerkat was in that space early, and we've seen it you know evolve into something that's kind of a little more niche than I think people may have originally thought it could be used for. Uh, it'll be interesting to see once it's included on an Apple TV, and then. Therefore, you know, theoretically on TVs, you know, across the country, if it can become more of a broadcast, you know, platform for live events, for people who are covering news, things like that. Um, you, you know, I think ca calling it like a live version of YouTube is a little bit of a stretch, but certainly getting on that many, many TVs, uh, it makes it much more interesting than just being kind of like getting linked to through Twitter. Well, Jason, thank you so much. Jason Abruziz is a reporter at Mashable, and he's at H Jason Abruziz on Twitter. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. And finally, tonight, we like to talk a lot about robots on this show. While some fear that the robots are coming for our jobs or for our children or for our souls, I think we would all be better off working with the robots instead of turning them into our Siri-like slaves. Now, one way we can start being kinder to robots is to stop trying to beat them up. CNET's technically incorrect reports that a man in Japan has been arrested for kicking Pepper, the emotion reading robot. Now, we have a video of Pepper, but we, we're not going to show you the video of the allegedly drunk man kicking Pepper because we're a family show and also because there is no video and this story might be made up and it might have been made up by robots. We don't even know but no one's doubting that it could have happened. Be nice to the robots, please. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Tomorrow, Tech News Today will be at 9 a.m. Pacific instead of 10 a.m. Pacific. And at 10 a.m. Pacific, please join Mike Elgin, Alex, Alex Lindsay, myself, and other guests to see Apple's announcements of new phones, a new Apple TV, new news, and more. And you can subscribe to Tech News Tonight on Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, TuneIn, RSS, or wherever else fine podcasts are streamed. And please leave a review and let us know how you like the show. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.